Hello, and welcome to this free Lunch and Learn webinar by Accelerate Computer Training. Optimize your creative workflow using Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. I'm Tim Jones, owner of Accelerate Computer Training, and I want to thank you for attending today. In these next 60 minutes, we'll get to watch a designer at work and learn why she does things the way she does them. Your microphones are off during this webinar to keep the audio channel clear. We are recording this session and we'll send you the link as soon as it is posted on our YouTube channel. If you have a question during the session, please type it into the chat window. We'll try to reserve the last few minutes of the session for answering questions. Our presenter today is not only a designer, but also a fine artist, Adobe certified expert, Adobe certified instructor, subject matter expert writer, Adobe community professional, Adobe education leader, Adobe user group manager, and I am proud to say that she's one of our wonderful trainers here at Accelerate Computer Training. So without further ado, let's bring on Hanna Messer. Hi everybody, I'm so happy to be here and uh, give you a, just a little look into my daily window, how I work when I need to design something in InDesign as a final project, and how do I start my workflow? So to begin that, I'm going to share my screen, and then I have a presentation that I made in Adobe Spark, which is something that one day I would love to show you how to use it. Um, but this is actually, I'm inside Spark, Adobe Spark right now. And I created a presentation and I called it Publishing for Educators, workflow using Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign to create a, a threefold brochure. So what you see here in the beginning, I just want to talk to you about what is workflow and what is InDesign as a final project. So InDesign is basically the living in the industry for page design and software layout. So what do we do in InDesign? We design posters, we design um, flyers, we design collateral, uh, style guide, and so on. So it's almost in every place that you're gonna ask for a job or look and apply for a job, they're gonna ask you if you are familiar with InDesign. And like I said, it is the leading industry page design software. And you can see here, I just have a few uh, samples here, and actually this sample is not my work. I took it from Adobe Stock, which is part of my workflow also. So what is a workflow when we start talking about it? Because everybody lately thinking about workflow. For me, using Adobe InDesign, Adobe Illustrator, and Adobe Photoshop, it's not using each software separately. It's what is it bringing me to, me, to my table? Because a lot of people will ask me sometime, they'll say, why are you using Photoshop? There's a lot of a lot of free software that do almost the same thing and you can use that. Why are you using Illustrator? There's vector-based software that's less money and you don't have to do a subscription online. So why would you use that? And my answer is I like the workflow. It saves me time because I can create a library in Photoshop, Illustrator or in InDesign, put all the assets in there, start working on a project send it to my client for review and come back to my desktop and believe it or not nowadays also to the ipad because photoshop is already on the ipad and i think coming october 21st illustrator is coming to the ipad so sometime i actually starting my design somewhere else coming back to my desktop and start my workflow so basically, if you're looking at what is a workflow in the dictionary that they tell you is designing and series of definition and then put them all together. For me, workflow is taking the three software together and then putting it into one idea. So I have an idea and I have a concept and I'm sending it to a client or sitting with the client and then I'm sketching it, believe it or not, I still go to the paper and sketch the stuff that I have, and then I meet with them again. Then I'm going in and looking for images based on their requirements. And I'm gonna look at the images and I'm gonna start refining them. 
Then I'm gonna create graphics and that will be in Adobe Illustrator. Once I have the Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop files kind of like together and ready, I'm starting my layout. And in this case, I'm gonna feature for you like a three fold brochure layout. So I have a template and I have the text that I wanna place in there. And then I'm gonna to go to InDesign and start working. And I can go back and forth between InDesign and Photoshop. I can go back and forth between InDesign and Illustrator to fix my files. At the end, I have my final project, which I package it. I show it to a client. I can have a PDF, but more than that, nowadays I can actually publish it online. So like I said, in this presentation, I will go over how I do the threefold brochure. I'm actually not gonna construct it all the way. And I'm gonna be like, um, kind of like a food show. You know, some of the food is already ready and some of them I'm gonna to explain to you how I did that because in an hour, there's not enough time for me to show you exactly how I do that. But I have all the files ready and then I'm gonna show you and go through it. And feel free to ask questions in the chat. If I have time, I'm gonna look at the chat. And if not, toward the end of the presentation, I will leave some time to a Q&A and you can ask me some questions. Why do I do that? How can I do it differently? Is there any other ways to do it? Love questions and love the why. And when I conduct these classes also at Team's Place, um, at Accelerate Computer Training, I always tell the students, I want a conversation. I want you to be engaged. I don't want you just to write down the recipe. I want you to ask me, why are you doing it? Because I kind of want you to understand it. If you understand the workflow, you're gonna do a good job. If you don't understand that, you're gonna just gonna work like a robot and then in a new job, you're not gonna know what to do. So I hope that's kind of like clear. So I'm gonna start in Photoshop. And I'm just gonna show you a few images here, but I'm gonna jump into Photoshop in a second. And then you can see here, I have a few files and I might go in and just extract one of them. So you see, maybe I wanted to use this uh, file from Watts Towers to create something. And I kind of wanted to use just the dancer. So I purchased this um, image from Adobe Stock, but I don't want to use the dancer and the dancerette, if you call that, the two of them. Uh, so I just want to use her. So I actually extracted her from the image and used that. And by the way, I use this image for a lot of other stuff later. And of course, I have a lot more images that I put into my brochure, but we're going to go in and look only into this too. Then I'm jumping into Adobe Illustrator. So actually the brochure that I decided to do was Art and Music in Los Angeles, which is Los Angeles Hidden Gem. Because in Los Angeles, we have a lot of art and music and I'm signing in from LA, I live in LA, and people don't know about certain places. I might do even level two of this uh, Art and Music brochure because I find so many hidden gems about art and music in LA. So in this one, I kind of chose to feature certain places that I love and I love to go to. And then I created a logo. So the logo has certain colors. So I use Myriad Pro and I use um, Time Romance to do the end. And I conducted it, constructed it all together. Then I wanted to have some music over there. So I found an image with the music and actually vectorize it in Photoshop and in Illustrator, so. So then I had all the colors and I created a library. So you can see here, this is the image and of my library that I created in Adobe Creative Cloud and all the assets went there. And of course, I'm gonna have to remind you, always put it also on your desktop. Don't just trust the cloud. I always have it on a USB, I have it in my Dropbox, I have it on my backup, everywhere so I can find my file and bring them back. Then I open a template and then I started designing my brochure. And then after finishing the brochure, I basically packaged it, 
and then publish it online. And you can see here, it is kind of like the brochure and you'll see it in person in a minute because I'm gonna go in to the images right away. So I created this presentation just to give you some more information about how I work. And then if you need to refer to it later, I know that Tim is going to send you the, um, it's gonna send you the link to my presentation. And also I have published online over here link that that will take you directly to the file that I publish on my publish online portal. All the way back, of course, you know, I have some information about myself. So you can follow me on LinkedIn, Behance, and Instagram. Um, the last month I started to um, stream on Behance for educators and every Wednesday at 6.30 in the evening, I'm talking about different feature each time in Photoshop, Illustrator, or InDesign, and especially educators and students are coming in to listen and see the tips and the tricks. So I'm just gonna jump right away to Photoshop. And I wanna make sure you guys see my screen. So Tim, if you are looking at the chat, just let me know if everybody has any question right now. It will do, Hannah, it's clear. Everything good. looks good, we're seeing your Photoshop. Perfect. So this is an image that I have here, but how did I start it? So I started it actually from here. And I wanted to go in and extract the dancer. So I have to go into some of the selection tools in, Illust in Photoshop. So I'm gonna go into Photoshop here. I'm gonna move in my tool panel and then what kind of selection tool I would use. And if you know a little bit of Photoshop, there's a lot of selection tools nowadays, but the two selection tools that are new one came up in 2019 and one came up in 2020 and they are based on artificial intelligence and Adobe calls it Adobe Sensei, which means that behind the scene, there is a way to calculate the image and then make it a lot easier. I love it, but I already can tell you that if you come to my class, I'm gonna show you all the, all the Photoshop uh, selection tools. Why? Because you never know if the image is going to be okay with certain kind of selection tools. So I'm gonna start with the first one and then I'm gonna go to the area that I have object selection tool and then quick selection tool and magic wand. And then I can go first and go to select subject and you see it all the way up in the option bar. If you do not see it, if you are, let's say on the move tool, you're not gonna see it, you're gonna find it under the select and subject. So basically, if I go in here, uh, sensei, it's gonna look around and say, what do I want to go in and select? Not bad, look at that, hallelujah, just beautiful, but if I want to take the two of them together, I might use it, but I just want her. So what are my options right now? I can go to my lasso tool, hold down the option or alt key, and then subtract the dancer from the selection and continue selecting her. And also, or I can decide, you know what? I'm going to use another tool. So I'm going to deselect command or control D and by the way, I'm using some shortcuts, not a lot. And when I say command, I'm referring to Mac. And when I say control, I'm referring to window users. When I say option or alt, I'm referring option to Mac users and alt to window users. The rest is the same. So you hear me saying, hold on this key or this key so you know who you are and you're gonna find your own modifier key. So now I'm gonna go and try the new tool, object selection tool. So this one, I kind of like smile when I say it, it's kind of like the, the select subject kid, I call it. It does what select subject does, but it will go inside an area that has more than one subject and decide which one it is going to take. 
And I can go with it with lasso tool or with a rectangular tool. So I can go, let's say, to my lasso tool. And all the way here, look what I'm doing. I'm just going to try just to go around the denser. And maybe I did something that's not so great, but I'm going just around the denser because I don't want to get him right now. And look what I got here. All the way here, I just got her, and almost I have the area selected, and I can decide what to do with it right now. While I'm here, I can actually go into the same select lasso tool, and if I go to the second symbol, I can add to the selection. If I go to the third one, I can subtract from the selection. But now I'll have to go to another page. I like to go to a place called Select and Mask. This is my favorite place in Adobe Photoshop because I'm going to jump to another screen. I'm still within Photoshop, and that's going to show me how many things are selected already. And I can, on one side, improve the selection. And on the other side, I can go and do other things to the selection itself. So I'm going to click on Select and Mask. And by the way, if you do not see Select and Mask on your option bar for some reason, you can always go to Select menu bar and go to Select and Mask. So I'm going to go to Select and Mask. And this is what I have right now. So now I have the properties on the right side and the tools on the left side. And then you're going to ask me, why do I see this screen and not another one? Because yesterday I worked with Photoshop and probably I stayed on this screen. So in the view menu, you can click here and see different views. This is only shows you where you are in this area and how much you selected and how much more you need to select. Then I can go in to the marching ends and I can stay here and start fixing my selection. Then I can go into my overlay mode and I have like an overlay of a mask. And by the way, you can change the color over here to change the color of the area that you have. Also, you can go to opacity and see what you have to select. And like this, you can see it on black, you can see it on white, black and white, and on a layer. So you can choose any area that you're comfortable with. And by the way, there is a shortcut to toggle through it. And if you toggle with the F key on your keyboard, you're just gonna see which one you feel the most comfortable with. So let's say I'm comfortable right now with the overlay, and then I'm gonna make it kind of like a little bit, and then I'm gonna zoom into it. And now I'm just going to go in and see the areas that I didn't like. I'm using the Wacom tablet, so hopefully that's going to help me to help select. And on the left side, I can have other selection tool. I have the quick selection tool. I have the refine brush tool, which will select the edges of her skirt or her tutu, if you might say. I have a regular brush that I can add and subtract. I still have the object selection tool and I also have the lasso tool. So over here, I can go in, let's say, and add to the selection. And if I feel like adding her tutu here, I'm gonna go in and do stuff like that. And then it is gonna go in and add that to the selection. And now you can see I added that. So if I don't like this area here or don't like the area here, I can go in and choose another tool. So let's say if I'm using the brush, I can go to the brush size all the way up in my control and basically go in and draw on her head. So you can see I added some stuff with the head. Maybe she has stuff with her fingers over here. And I'm not gonna do a perfect selection right now because I have the other one already ready for us. But you can see here, that I'm gonna start going in and fixing the selection. Once I have the selection ready, and let's say I don't want this area here, you can see here I can make the brush a little smaller. I have a little delay over zoom, and that's why you don't see it so fast. But you can see here I'm subtracting from the selection 
using my Wacom tablet. Let's say I did a good job already. And if I feel like it's a good job, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to edge detection. And when I go to edge detection, I like to go to the black and white area because I wanna do the edge detection to the area of her dress, not everywhere. Because when you can go to edge detection and go and bring the radius, it might take a lot of stuff that you don't want, but you can see here, look at her tutu. It's coming in and I see all the furly things that I have there and other stuff I actually can fix. I also have a global refinement tool if I wanna refine some areas. And I also can go to this tool and say, you know what, I kinda wanna have a little bit more of the tutu coming out. You see here, more stuff is coming out, more stuff is coming out. The end, I usually collapse it and then I'm gonna go to my output settings. And then the output setting is really cool because it gives you a lot of options. It will give you a selection, a layer mask, a new layer, a new layer with a layer mask, a new document completely, and a new document with a layer mask. So you can have your choices, how you're gonna go in and export your file. So let's say I'm gonna decide to do it a new layer with a layer mask. And if I gonna go in and click escape, look at see this, it's not the perfect selection, but you can see what I have here. And I can go back to my file now click on the mask and start refining it again. I can also hold down the option or alt key, click on it, see what I have on the mask and fix it from here. I can also go in to my mask itself and in the properties panel, I can go back here and I can jump again to select a mask and refine it again and again, which gives me a complete freedom and also makes it absolutely non-destructive. Because if I was holding the shift key, you see I have the entire image and I can start from the beginning. So now I'm gonna go to the good file and then I'm gonna show you what you have here. So this is actually the good file that I already went in and even cropped it. Why? Because I kind of wanted to have the entire area here. So you can see I cropped the stuff, I pasted in here, and you see here I have more stuff there. I just went in and cropped the stuff here. But if I'm gonna hold down the option, I'm gonna go hold down the shift key to turn it off, look what I did here. And this is something that I wanted to, to talk to you about. Remember I told you I cropped it? How did I crop it? I cropped it non-destructively. So that means that I left the pixel over there. So if you really need to have the, another image or whatever it is, you might see some other part of the image over there. And then if I'm gonna go back here again, I can go in and have the stuff. So that's what I like to do in the beginning. And then when I'm gonna go and start the stuff that I have, I'm gonna go in and start working on it again. So in the beginning, when I crop my images in Photoshop, I make it non-destructive. So in this case, this is what I did. I kind of saved it. You can see all of the tutus and the areas, and I can even change it again. But I like the idea, and I like the selection, and I left it, and I saved it as an Adobe I mean Photoshop file, PSD, and I called it Ballerina Dancing or Ballerina. This is the ballerina dancing, and this is the one by itself. Then I went in, let's say, to another image, and I have a bunch of images from areas, and this is the Watts Tower. And then in a Watts Tower, all what I wanted to do is I wanted to create some kind of a mask to it, and I want to go and level it a little bit. So how did I do that? All what I did right now, I'm just going to go and duplicate the layer, and then I am going to delete the mask and then even delete the level. So that was the image I got and I wasn't really crazy about it. And babe, by the way, I shot this image. I went to Watts Towers downtown and I took all the images. And this is a beautiful, beautiful place to go to if you guys have a chance sometime to go and explore this masterpiece of an art. 
So what I did here, I kind of wanted a smooth transition. I could have done it not in the best way in InDesign, but it's so much better in Photoshop. So all what I did, I went all the way down to the layer mask symbol. I opened an empty layer mask. I made the foreground black, the background white. I went to the gradient tool, made sure I am from foreground to background. And while I'm there, I just went in there and just made a smooth transition. So if I hold down the Option or Alt key, you can see my mask. And once you understand that, you know, masking in Photoshop. Wherever you see white, you reveal everything in front of you. Whenever you see black, you conceal. And then you have a smooth transition. And that's what I have there. So I just did that. And then I added an adjustment layer. Again, I can add the adjustment layer all the way down from the layers panel. Or I can go into layer and go to adjustment layer. And I think I did levels. So when I go into levels, I can go in and decide what kind of levels I want to use. And I can actually go to a preset. So you can see the preset is increasing the contract. And then I'm going to make it a lot brighter. Or I'm going to make it increasing over here. Or basically, I'm just going to go and do it myself. So what am I gaining here when I'm doing that? I'm getting a non-destructive change of a color that you have. And then if you save it as a Photoshop file and you place it within InDesign, you will see all the layers. So I saved that and I went now to, and then did the others of course, and I'm going back to let's say Illustrator, which is gonna be a little bit different. Any questions so far? Are we okay, Tim? Yeah, there's nothing in the chat. Okay. So I'm gonna go to Illustrator right now. And then look at that. I did something fun in Illustrator with this dancer, nothing to do with this brochure, but this is one of the things that I love to do. I went to Illustrator, I rasterized the dancer, I recolored her, and I made from her different kind of brushes and symbols and all kind of stuff like that. So you can see that you can do a lot of stuff from just one image that you extract from Photoshop. But then I'm going to go back here and look at the note. So that was an image that I found. It was um, a Creative Cloud file. And by the way, I kind of like forgot to mention it. But if I'm going to my Creative Cloud libraries now, I believe I still have the cloud library that I created to this project. So these are all the cloud libraries that I have. And then I can see here, I have art and music in LA. And look what I have here. I have the colors that I used. I have the color theme that I used. I have the character and paragraph style that I use in InDesign. I have some of the graphics. So if I don't feel like even show you how I did it, I basically can drag and drop it directly in here and have it there. So that stays on Adobe Creative Cloud on your site and you can open it from every Adobe application. Believe it or not, today even you can open it in Adobe Spark, you can open it in Adobe Bridge, After Effects, Premiere and everywhere. So if you do a new library, when you start a job, you can say create new library, you can give it a name and then maybe I call it ACC underscore webinar and then do create. Look what it tells me over here. Over here, it tells me access your creative elements everywhere. And I can start going to the screen and I can click on the plus sign and bring the graphics. And now I can see the graphics over here. So this is how you work with libraries and you can go back and forth and bring your asset. You can even have your style guide completely in the library. You can invite people to go and share. You can export a library. You can go in and rename the library. If you go in and see that I spelled webinar uh, the, right, the wrong way. So I'm gonna go back here 
and, and then I'm gonna respell it again, so it's gonna be a little bit better, all kind of stuff like this. So basically, I call it my creative playground. I go in there and I play. And what I can do now with it, I can actually open it on the iPad. So what does it mean? When I go to Photoshop or Illustrator, and then I wanna go into a file and start going in and uh, saving it, I can go to File and Save As, and you're gonna get a dialog box right now, and it is gonna ask you, where would you like to save it? You can save it on your desktop, but you can also save it to your Creative Cloud document. Once you do that, you can open it from the iPad, Adobe uh, Photoshop on the iPad, and you can open it also from uh, Adobe Illustrator on the iPad and Adobe Fresco. I'm not gonna save it right now, but you can see what I'm doing. So here, what I did actually, I went in and I traced the image. I used image trace in uh, Illustrator because that was, a, a, was an Adobe Photoshop file to start with. And once I actually traced it using image trace, every area over here is its own little vector. So if you see here, I can double click and I can even dis change the color of the area. So if I kind of wanted to change the color, let's say to red, I change that. I can double click on this note to isolate it and see if I can isolate this area or depending what the area that I have. And then I can go in and create a different kind of note. So you can see here, depending how I traced it, that's how we can see the notes that I have and then I can isolate them and save it as an Adobe Illustrator file. So you can see here, the music note is already ready for me. So you're gonna ask me, if I am gonna place it in InDesign, am I going to go in and see the white background? And you're actually not gonna see that. So if I'm gonna go into my properties panel now in Illustrator, which I love the advanced properties panel now in Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign, because they can give you an all-in-one preview. And I can go into my transparency grid and look what I see right away. It shows you that actually I have a transparent background. So if I'm gonna place it in InDesign, I'm not gonna have uh, the white background. So that's really cool to go and look at that here. If you're in the middle of a job, you're not gonna see this transparent background over here. You always can find it under view and then show transparency grid under the view menu bar. So you can go to it every time in Illustrator just to find what you did. The next thing that I did is I went in and I actually chose colors. And you can see most of the logo already here. But if I'm looking at the swatch panel, look what I have there. I already decided on colors ahead of time. And this is something that you do, of course, with your client or your peers or the art director, whoever is in charge of the job. So I call it kind of like the color style guide. And then you see in Illustrator, I have a tiny little triangle in the end of every square. These guys are global colors. And that's super important when you are creating a logo in the Illustrator to have global colors. And why is that? Because if you change your mind later, let's say I'm gonna put the art um, the music in Los Angeles and let's say I'm gonna group it, I mean, I'm gonna copy it. And then I am going to go in and open a new artboard next to it. And then I'm gonna go in and paste it on this artboard. And I'm gonna make it really tiny. I'm just gonna show you a case. And then maybe you have it in other pages. I'm gonna do only one artboard, but you can see here, pretend you have a lot of artboards and you show the client different sizes of your logo and how to put it somewhere else. And after doing all this hard job and you're saving your file, you get a phone call. And they said to you, oh, listen, um, we just got a message from the headquarters and we're no longer using um, this magenta color as a guide. So we have different kind of colors and you're thinking, whoa, 
Let me start from the beginning. But because I created global colors, I can actually double click on the main global color. I'm gonna look on my preview and basically based on the colors that this changed me, I can start fixing the stuff. So they decided to change me, to change the main color to 64, 29, 30, and 15, and look what happens here. Because the rest of the stuff with the tints of the same colors, I got a global change in one second. If I did not do it with global colors, I'm gonna have a job to do and go from one place to another. So one of the workflows that I usually do, I create global colors when I create style guides to other stuff that I do so I can go and change it. I'm just gonna cancel it out. But in general, when I paint and draw an illustrator, I don't do global colors because I kind of feel like painting it with different kind of colors. So you can see over here, I painted the girl, I had some gradient, no global colors here. Why? Because she's mine. And I am not going to tell, let anybody to tell me how to color her. So I just made her just like this and she's all good. But when you do kind of like logos and things like this, super, super important. So how did I construct it? I can go back here and you can see here, if I click on the word art, I can see I just chose something very simple. Myriad Pro, because and I went in, I did Myriad Pro Black. And yes, I know, I have the entire group of Myriad Pro, and it really makes me laugh, because look how many family members uh, Myriad has, a lot of cousins. So Myriad Pro is kind of like still one of my favorites, because I don't have to change the right to choose the regular one, but look how many I have. And this was, um, I purchased it, but for now, if you don't have that, you can go actually to Creative Cloud directly from your Creative Cloud subscription and you can download it as an Adobe Creative Cloud font, Adobe font, and that's gonna be in your cloud library and not on your desktop. Another thing that I love here, look what I have here now. When I go over the fonts that I have or the typefaces, I can see which one I want to use. So I have kind of like a preview right away. I also can go in and look at the stuff over here, but if I'm going to go to the type menu bar and I'm going to go to the fonts over here, that's when you're going to see the different things that you have and you can see which one is a cloud font. So when you saw over here, my Myriad is not a cloud font because I have it. But if you're going to download Myriad, you might see a little cloud next to it. But if I'm gonna change it, let's say to Kumi Pro, and then maybe I'm gonna do it bold, you can see that I have it here. This is a cloud font. And the only difference here is if I'm gonna go in and do anything to it, it's basically going to not be part of my font that I'm gonna work with. Then in the music over here, I stayed with the same font. Myriad Light, I went back here and Myriad Light Condense. The only one that I changed was this one that I went into Times Roman and I did the end sign. And what you do with that is basically what I did, I clicked somewhere and let's say I'm gonna do the end sign even in all the way down here and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. And I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go, let's say I'm gonna do it 72. So this one is a Kumin Pro, and then that's the hand sign. I don't like this end sign so much, but I'm gonna use it for now. Look at this beautiful end sign. This one I made myself. So I'm just gonna pretend that I'm doing another one like this, and I'm gonna use this one right now. And then I went in and I changed the color, and I went in and I filled it with this color. But in order for me to kind of work with it and make something different to it, after duplicating it a few times, I went into type and I created outline. And once I created outline, it's no longer a typeface. So basically what I did here, I started designing the area that I have here. So if I click on this one, you see I gave it some kind of a stroke. 
so it looks a little nice and elegant. But I have this little circle over there here, and the circle is going in on top of music, and that's kind of like be the eye of the music. So I aligned it. So how did I do that? I just went into, um, let's say, the ellipse, and I hold down the option or alt and shift key, and I created another ellipse. And let's say I decided to measure where it's going. And then actually I selected the two of them. And here I had a choice. I could have gone to my properties panel and go to my pathfinder and unite it. And now you can see it's united. Or I could have gone to my shape builder tool. And then if I double click on it, I kind of wanted to make sure I see the cursor. And then if I go over it, I can go in to the cursor and I can see that my cursor is some light color. And if I zoom in to do it together, I have that. And now I can go in and change the color. So it doesn't really matter for you which one you are going to use. I'm gonna go and select that. And then I'm gonna go in and choose that with this color. And then I went in to my stroke and I gave it a tiny little one point stroke. So you can see here how you can go in and create type and from the type, you create outline, save it, and then bring it back to InDesign later when you place it. And by the way, when I save the file and do anything that I have, I have my layers. Layers in, in Illustrator and in InDesign are really for organization, but I try to work with the layers so I can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna jump over now to InDesign. And I'm gonna bring it over here. And before I start, just to show how I did, I'm gonna go into one of my favorite uh, features in InDesign. And by the way, the, now they have it also in Illustrator. And I'm gonna say Shift W, which is gonna be in Illustrator, a different kind of shortcut. But look what I have here. I have the presentation in front of me. It's done. So I want a background to be a different background just for viewing. So I'm gonna click on the white. I see a white background, a G, I see a gray background. And now you see, you see here, this is the Watts Tower that I just made. This one, some typefaces that I use, same colors. So I'm staying with the same area to give, give me a cohesive workflow. This is my sign over here. You can see here I have drop cap, and that's another image that I created some kind of uh, a transition. Now I'm gonna go into the inside of the, um, the brochure, and now you can see that I have the text that I placed in, and I created some kind of uh, images all the way up here. That's the same watts, so showing you the stuff that I have. I have the Watts Tower, the Frederick Foundation, and these guys are next to each other, the Broad and the Hauser and Wyth Galleries, and all about the Music Center. And because I wanted to emphasize the Music Center, I put my dancer. And over here, I just put Art and Music Downtown Los Angeles. So now if I'm gonna go in and escape it, I'm gonna start checking out what I did. And I add actually a template that I actually didn't, I mean, actually I did make the template. I made a template and in the template I had the threefold brochure. And actually I just closed my tools panel by mistake. And then I'm gonna go back here and put this one here. I like to work uh, with the panels always with two columns. That's kind of like my idea. So now for zooming in just to this area. And I'm gonna look into my page panel. And look what I have over here. This is a page panel over here. And then I have the panels and this is another one. And then I do have some kind of a template. So I have the outside and I have the inside master pages and in this case i didn't feel like putting anything on the master pages i just made the sizes in the master pages so you can see here that i have everything is ready for me already on my master pages to go back here and work with it and the same thing with the inside and now i'm just going to go back to this area 
So you see here on one page, I have that, I have the inside and I have the outside of that. So if I'm gonna go in, let's say to this layer over here, and I'm gonna go into the layer and see I named my layer. Everything is really working perfectly and very organized. It's almost like if you sit next to a table, you don't want your table to be cluttered. You want it to be clean. So I prepared layers ahead of time. A layer for the master item, a layer for my background, images and graphics, and text. In InDesign, it's important to remember whatever you see on the layer is spread-based. So if I'm gonna go to images and graphics, you will see over here on this layer only the stuff that you have on this spread. You don't see the other spread. So what do you see? Adobe Illustrator, a PDF that I brought in, that will be my logo. Actually, I'm gonna move it here so you can see it a little bit better. So see here, yeah, that's my logo. And then that, I have another white logo. Same logo, but I made it white. And then I have the Watts Towers. And then I have the Symphony. And then I have the AI notes. So all the images are here, and I also have the text here. So it's so organized. I don't have other stuff there. And then the background is over here. So I know right away where to go. So now if I'm going to select just this image and I want to see how I placed it, I'm going to go to the links panel and I can see it says what, what's PSD. And then I can go to object, object layer options. And look what I have here. I can click on the preview. And if I don't want to have some layers, I can go in and turn on and off some layers. So you can see here, it will turn it on and off some of the layers that you have. And then you can go in and out and play with it and just create the stuff that you have. The same thing I'm going to have if I'm gonna go into my uh, Illustrator file. I'm gonna go to object and then I'm gonna go object layer option. And then this one actually had one layer. Didn't do a lot of stuff with it. Now I'm just gonna go in and move to the other side. And then we're gonna look at some of my styles that I have. And by the way, I also opened a slug on top of each area. And I kind of reminded myself, what is it? Is it an inside? Is it an outside? It's in the center. Because I don't remember sometimes where am I working. Now I'm looking at my paragraph styles. And I'm gonna move it out a little bit. You can look at the paragraph styles today in InDesign also when you're working with your properties panel, but I'm gonna go in with the standalone. So if I'm gonna go in and just click on what's tower, you can see that I created a style for the heading. And if I right click on it and just edit the heading, just to see what I did, you can see exactly the format that I did. I did a certain indent and spacing, I have a space after everything that I had, but I also use something that I really like, and I have something called paragraph rules. And then when I have the paragraph rule, I basically went in and put it on top of the area and then changed the stuff and made it a different color. You can have borders, you can have shading and all kind of stuff like that. And then if I click OK, you see this is what I have here. I made some paragraph for the text over here. I did actually a URL for everything and that we're gonna see it in your hyperlink. And I changed the character of the hyperlink. So you can see I have a regular hyperlink, I have a white hyperlink, and I have a red hyperlink to put it inside. Because by default, InDesign makes for your hyperlink and usually it's a light blue so I change my character style. If I go back down here, that's my tagline that I have here. And then I made the images here and each image I basically used over here. I worked it and I did it something called jump over. So it took the stuff and pushed the text a little bit. And believe it or not, I actually went in and even saved my object style. So everything is actually saved there for me. 
So if I'm going to need later to open a template. I have a template that has all the paragraph, character style, and everything with it. And then I can start working on another project that has almost the same thing, but maybe we can have different colors a little bit. But if your company wants you to do different kind of brochure like this, that's when you want to go back and make sure you have the same paragraph styles. Some of the times, if I have something a lot bigger than that, I might take the paragraph style and put them in little folders and give them names. So let's pretend that I really like, uh, let's say, let's just go into the dancer. I just want to show you the dancer here and the object, layer, object, option. And you can see here, I put a layer just with the layer. If I chose to go back now to Photoshop, I could have gone to the link. I can go to the flyout menu and then I can go back here and edit the original and she's gonna jump in right away. Do you see here that I have something that says a question mark? And this is something that I'm probably never gonna do again. I made the text as a link and then I change everything. So it's telling me that I don't have the text anymore. So that was kind of like an issue that I shouldn't have done, but next time I'm not gonna make it as a link. So if, if I like what I do right now before sending it to the client, you check if you have any mistakes, you do a spell check and everything, and then you're gonna go into file and package. And when you go into package it, basically it's gonna tell you the summary, the font that you're using, and it's showing you, so if I show problem only or not problem, all the fonts that I have there are there, they are not cloud fonts. And then links and images, and you can see the links that I have there, the colors, the print setting, and the external plugin. Everything is kind of looking okay for me. I can create the print instructions, and I can go and package it. It always asks you to save it the first time. And then it wants to go in and save it somewhere. And I'm gonna go, let's say now to my desktop and I'm gonna save the package. And that's important, we're gonna tell you over here because they're gonna tell you that they cannot take your fonts. Uh, only the font that you purchase, the rest of the fonts, you have to activate it yourself. They're not gonna be in your folder. They're telling you they're taking the link. They're telling you that CJK fonts are not compatible, which is Chinese, Japanese, and Korean fonts. You can also include an IBML, which is gonna be compatible for version from CS6, CS5, and CS4, and then include a PDF print. And they give you presets, but what you have to pay attention is the first five presets do not have a spread. So I made myself some stuff that have spreads over here so let's say i'm gonna go and say spread with hyper and that's gonna be that and i'm gonna package it so now it's gonna tell me that i have the links i'm gonna click okay it might even tell me that i'm not allowed to take fonts and things like this and basically what i have here i'm patch packaging the file and you might might want to go back and open uh Acrobat for me, but I think I disabled it because I didn't want to have so many images together. So I already have a folder to send to my client. But what if the client is not at home now next to the desktop and he wants it now? And how many of you heard it in your workflow? Can I have it yesterday? So that's when you can take the InDesign file and go all the way up to the top, to the share area. You can quick export it as a PDF. You can package it from here. You can share for review with your peers, but my favorite is publish online. And when you go publish online, it basically go into your Creative Cloud publish online portal. And over here, they're asking you for the name. I'm just gonna give it number two. You can have a description, a description so you can say, please check spelling and colors or whatever you feel like putting it here. What's important is to tell it how many pages you want and is it a single page or a spread? Absolutely important. You also can tell it, allow viewers to download it as a PDF. If you trust your viewer to download it as a PDF, he can print it at home by himself. And then you also have an advanced area 
And if they want to see a little thumbnail of your company and not the thumbnail of the first page, you can choose an image and put it at the thumbnail. So I'm going to go and publish it. It will take a second. And as soon as you see it's coming, you're going to see my publish online portal. And it's going to tell me some stuff. It was here and I can go in. Do you wish to continue? I say it. And now it's going to go give me my dashboard. So you see it's uploading the files right away. And now you have some option. You can view the document, which I'll do in a minute. You can copy the URL and send it right away to your client. You can put it on Facebook if you want, on Twitter if you want to tweet something. You can send a message. You can also go to your publish online dashboard. I'm going to go in and just view the document, just showing you what the client is going to see. And then he gets the image over here, and basically it's going to go in and see the stuff here. And it sees the entire image, and I can go all the way down to the area, and then it can go in and delete, I mean, go back here and download the file as soon as it has. Does that make sense? So now if I go back to InDesign, I'm going to close this area here. And what if you did already publish online, but now you want to see if it's okay? You can always go to File, Publish Online from here, Recently Published, and Publish Online Dashboard. So if I'm going to go into my Publish Online Dashboard, it's going to take you to the dashboard of Publish Online. It is a little small over here, so I might make it a little bit bigger so you can see. And you can see my little document that I have. So what if you all of a sudden ask me in the middle of a conversation, uh, do you do other stuff than just this kind of stuff? Do you publish stuff about other things? I'm going to say, oh yeah, look at that. I just created a creativity workshop about how to use uh, Photoshop uh, in a different way. And I actually publish it online. And I can actually show it to you because it's already there. Might be a little slur here, but this is actually my tutorial about how to do kind of like nice, intense uh, portrait with Adobe Photoshop. So I don't have to look on my desktop and to find it. It's already on my publish online. Does that make sense? And this is why I kind of like publish online so much. And then I'm going to go back to InDesign. And now we're almost at the top of the hour. So I'm going to see if you guys have any questions. Well, Hannah, there is one question that came in a little while ago. It is that in the beginning, you showed how to select the whole image of the, uh, the two dancers, the ballerina and uh, the male dancer. Uh -huh. uh, you showed how to select the whole image by object selection tool when the uh, ant lines started around the two images. And the question is, the image can be extracted just by doing that? correct or do we have to go through all of these other tools to extract it no well it's two two different tools if you do select subject it's going to decide what subject if you do object select you have to go on top of the area of the area that you want so let's say if i go to the rectangle tool and i want to try just to take him it's a little harder here because they are overlapping so that's why you don't get a complete selection but you see here, it selected him and not the dancer. So now I almost isolated him and now I'm going to go in and add his, let's adjust his arm. So look what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go in, oh, I made a mistake here. See, you don't want to do that. So you have to hold on the shift key and now I'm going to try to add his arm. And now if it's almost okay, that's when I go to select and mask and continue the selection. So you have in select an object, you have a rectangle and a lasso tool. That's the only lasso tool that you can, you, you, the selection that you have. So now if I'm gonna go in and I wanna bring his hair over here, I'm just gonna go in and see if it will select a little bit more stuff. And now I'm gonna see, I have some little things. You have to be really careful and now I can see I select him, and now I'm gonna to go to select and mask and fix him. Does that make sense? Absolutely. 
Um, there are no more questions in the chat, but I've, un I've given the ability for everyone to unmute their microphones. So if you do have any last minute questions, uh, folks, feel free to uh, one at a time, hopefully, unmute your mics and ask them before we adjourn. Well, I got to thank you from Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, for thanking me. It was my pleasure and Tim knows how much passion I have and I love teaching it. I hope you got it from my voice. Every time I do something, I get excited like it's the first time because I kind of love working with this uh, application and it's really, really helped me with my career and my work. Well, fantastic, Hannah. I'm gonna go ahead and just move to my last slide and I uh, just, again, want to thank you all for joining us in this webinar today. We teach these topics and many, many others in our live public training classes. So please go to our website at accelerategomputertraining.com to see the classes we offer and what you can learn there. You can register right on the site and you may attend remotely or in person. We're located in downtown Long Beach. We hope to see you all in an upcoming training session soon. We recorded this webinar and we'll send you the link as soon as it's up on our YouTube channel. And um, I guess if there aren't any more questions, then we will bid you farewell. We hope these uh, strategies and techniques that Han has demonstrated will increase your productivity and your creativity, share what you've learned with others, and then tell them where you learned it. Have a great day and uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you everybody. That was a pleasure.